So I hope the sound cancellation will work okay uh, because I'm in a quite noisy place. As I said, uh, these uh, recordings are a bit iffy. Uh, I will try to recapture uh, the lectures when I go come back to Winnipeg. But in the meantime, I just wanted to give you this. So this is the second part of the environmental environmentally transmitted pathogens lecture uh, about uh, models and so I called it part two. Uh, so what I want to do here is go back to some of the models we looked at in the previous lecture and look at them from the perspective of simulations because I think it's important as I've highlighted in my first lecture quite some time back uh, before the break. Um, I, I think, you know, running numerics is a, an important way to complement your mathematical work if you are doing mathematics. And if you're not doing mathematics, then it is a very useful thing to do because essentially if you're not analyzing the models mathematically, then you have to do something. And that something can definitely be numerical. So uh, I hope that I'll be able to record an, a last lecture about this uh, during the weekend. But in the meantime, uh, let me go over this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to several of the models uh, that we saw last week, um, well, earlier this week, uh, and show you how to model them. And I'll remind you that we took a look uh, at the first model that I also said that I would explain in more detail. And this is what I'm going to do first. So it's that tetanus model of Setanovic um, that we're going to look at first. So um, I'll remind you that the model looked something like this. And as I pointed out, this is an interesting model uh, in the sense that it has no human-to-human -human or animal-to-human -human transmission. Here it's exclusively the environment that transmits to humans. Um, so the model structure was as follows. So you had a newborn and susceptible incubating, newborn incubating population. Essentially, you have that whole left branch that corresponds to newborns uh, as well as here and that right branch that corresponds to the general population and then there's tetanus deaths here and i'm going to go into more details about this in a second so the first thing uh, is that here i'm going to show you the flow diagram so the model as i pointed out in the first lecture it's a discrete time model and I should point out that there are different ways to formulate discrete time models. The one that we are using here is somewhat analogous to the way we would do an ODE. There are other models that are uh, more oriented in terms of how long people survive in compartments. Um, this is not such a model. Uh, and so this is going to remind you very much of what uh, you've seen so far with ODEs. Um, so here uh, I should point out, okay, so here I'm not showing the demography uh, and I'll explain in a second. And also I should point out that the notation is mine. Uh, Setanovic uh, denotes the variables x1 to x9. Uh, I don't like this. I like my state variables to have a name that sort of makes it easy to remember what you're looking at. Uh, so the index B here is for borns, so newborns, okay? And the without index is the remainder of the population. D is for deaths. R is for uh, recovered, immune in that case. Um, so the, here are the flows as well as the rates at which the flows uh, take place. And I'm going to detail these in a, in a second and I'll go back and forth between this slide and the following slides. Uh, so the model looks something like this. And I should point out that delta that you see on the left 
represents the variation, not the, uh, the new value. So if you remember in an ODE, that, that's essentially very much akin to what we would do with an ODE because this is representing uh, how much change is happening in the different state variables because of the different factors. Uh, so let me uh, first comment this one. Uh, this says that the variation in the number of newborns is B, which is the birth rate, times the total population excluding the newborns and the dead. Okay, that T here at the bottom is uh, the everything except SB and D. Okay. So again, as I pointed out, this is the variation. So that means at the next time step, what will be in compartment SB is what is currently in SB plus this variation. Okay, so SB at time T plus BT will be the population in SB at the next time step. And I said that I was not showing demography. So here there should, if I showed demography, there would be an arrow coming in here into SB representing this flow of newborns, but we're not showing it here. Okay. Then there's also a uh, death and maybe let me uh, first uh, go to the parameters and explain what is happening. Okay, so there's an incubation period. Uh, so it's taken uh, and here I'm reproducing the values uh, mentioned in the paper of Sitanovic. Okay, so the incubation period is taken to be six days for newborns and eight days for the general population. And he computes that this means that there's a general, and this is one over this value, okay, of a general daily exit rate from, uh, oops, where am I? Here into here, okay, so LB and L are the incubating class, latent classes. So epsilon B times LB is how much, how, how much flow there is out of LB into IB and epsilon L is how much flow there is out of L into I, okay? And that's due to the incubation period, which is assumed to be shorter for newborns than it is for the general population. There's a mean duration of sickness. So the duration of sickness is typically three days for a newborn and 14 days for the general population. And that corresponds to exit rates of one third for the newborn and uh, 0.0714 uh, for the sick in the general population. Sick general in general, I need to fix the typo. Um, now, there is mortality from tetanus, and I should go back to the slides here to show you what happens. So suppose that I look at an infectious newborn or an infectious general population, you can see that they have three choices. I mean, there are three possibilities as to what the uh, person will become after this. Uh, they can become susceptible right away again. And note that if the newborns become susceptible, they become susceptible in the general population, not in the, uh, the newborn population. They can die from tetanus or they can recover and be immune. R is an immune class, so they can be immune for some time. Okay. Now, that pi here that you see, pi IBR, pi IBV, and pi IBS, and the corresponding pi IV, pi IR, and pi IS, they are proportion of the flows. So the flows happen at the rate gamma, which is the average, uh, the, the rate of moving out of I. So gamma. I, gamma B, IB is the rate of moving from outside, I mean, from IB in f to outside of IB. And once this flow is moving outside, it is then split in three, in this case, between 
direct recovery, recovery with uh, immune period or death. Okay, and this is what he says here, the mortality from tetanus. Uh, and here I'm going to suppose that we're working in the untreated tetanus case. Uh, mortality from tetanus has a fatality rate of 90% for newborns and 40% for the general population. That means if I go back to this graph, 90% of this flow outside of I goes here, IB goes to D, and the remainder is split between going to R and going to S. And likewise, 40% of the flow out of I goes to D, and the remainder goes to the two other compartments. Okay, uh, if you look at the paper of uh, Svetanovich, you will see that he has cases where he considers vaccination and etc. But here, this is the base model. Okay, so this is a very basic model. Um, and, and you can see this movement here. Okay, so for example, if I look at the infected newborns, uh, their rate of, uh, so first there's a proportion pi IBS uh, of the recovered uh, the, the uh, not yet in uh, not anymore infected that goes here there's a proportion where is it pi IBB that goes to D and there's a proportion pi IBR that goes here okay but they're all subject to the same exit rate from the IB compartment and the same is true for the general population. You can see them here going to the death compartment, here going to I, and here going to S. Now, immunity, uh, it's, it's wrong to say that there's immunity, okay? So they, uh, in principle, you should go directly from, if, if you recover without dying, of course, uh, you should go directly into the S. But what he incorporates in there, uh, one, oh, okay, before I go any further, I should point out that mortality rate is probably lower now than it was 50 years ago when uh, that model was published. I haven't updated the numbers, but it is, it could be an interesting thing to do is to see whether these numbers have changed a lot or not. Now, um, so what I was saying is immunity uh, does not follow infection, but the way, he, the reason why he incorporates immunity in there is that if you've uh, had tetanus, then uh, as a precaution, you will be vaccinated. So in general, you are vaccinated once you've had tetanus. So if you've cured, uh, if you've uh, recovered from tetanus, uh, you will have vaccination. Okay, so this is uh, this immunity that is these flows that you can see here. So this is going into the R and in the immunity is lost after some time, which is one over new on average. And uh, that moves you back to the S compartment. There's also immunity of newborns. So this is something we haven't seen in models so far. Uh, it is that uh, if the mother is vaccinated during the pregnancy, then the antibodies uh, are transferred onto the newborn. And so there is a period of immunity uh, that is inherited from the mother. Uh, that period of immunity is typically assumed to be quite short. Uh, so here he takes it at uh, six months. Okay, and this corresponds to this flow here which interestingly you see is a direct consequence of how many people recovered. So this is B is the birth rate. And so this says essentially that immunity of newborns is a consequence of this vaccination that takes place for recovered, what I was just talking about. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now the pi, as I was saying, they're the proportion of individuals who follow a certain route post-infection. And so pi i uh, bullet 
Uh, so if IB is the first component, it means it's uh, newborns that are infected. And so they can recover without immunity, they can recover with immunity or they can die. And for newborns, I remind you that the uh, hypothesis he makes is that it's 90%, so uh, 0.9 uh, proportion, 0.9 of the newborns that recover Act, well, not recover, but finish their infectious period, actually finish their infectious period because unfortunately they die. And for adults, it's 0.4, okay? And those, because it's a proportion, uh, those three numbers and those three uh, numbers must both sum to one. For the demography, he assumes live birth rate at 35 per thousand population and annual crude death rate without uh, the uh, disease, of course, of 15 per, hand, uh, per thousand. And so that gives you uh, an annual growth rate of 2% per population. And so the corresponding parameter values are these values here. Now, for the force of infection, uh, we saw that uh, before, uh, if what you incorporate in the force of infection is because there's no human to human transmission, the incidence is actually just proportional to how many susceptible individuals are in the population. And it is that susceptibility uh, is multiplied by a force of infection, uh, which combines the following, uh, uh, the following processes. So there's the degree of soil contamination, uh, with the bacterium, uh, the type of climate, because the bacterium lives longer or shorter depending on the climate, the frequency of lesions. So if, for example, you're considering a population that's working uh, in the fields, uh, they tend to uh, hurt themselves more in contact with the soil, and therefore they are more, uh, the, the force of infection is uh, higher, uh, and that is uh, correlated also with this proportion of rural population. Uh, socioeconomic uh, socioeconomic uh, conditions also plays a role in the force of infection, as does the level of medical care for the wounded and during uh, delivery of newborn. Okay. Uh, the force of infection, so he takes, and I should make clear, and I mean, and make it clear in a little while that I'm going to show you how to simulate this model, but I haven't really calibrated well. So I've taken the parameters that he's given, but I haven't done more work. And in particular, some work is needed to find values of the force of infection, lambda act on the susceptible population, lambda, and on the newborn population, lambda b. Okay, so what he does in the paper is that he looks at three different levels for lambda uh, to uh, look at uh, incidence rates of tetanus that correspond to those cases. So 200, 400, and 600 cases per 100,000 newborns, and without the newborns, 9, 18, and 27 cases. These correspond to the situation in some of the countries that he's considering uh, in 1970 when he wrote that paper. Now, let me spend a minute or two to discuss discrete time systems because this is a discrete time system. Uh, it's something that I don't, well, I haven't presented yet and maybe you haven't seen at all. So let me just take a minute to, uh, to talk about this. So what you've seen so far are ordinary differential equations. So there are, they are models of this form. So you have the time derivative, derivative with respect to time of the unknown x of t is a function of x of t, uh, where we often didn't forget the dependence on t, but we know it's there. I mean, we don't forget, we forget to write it down, but we know the dependence is there. And so we write x prime is f of x. Uh, x is typically a vector in Rn, and f is a vector field, so it's a function from Rn into Rn. And we consider that with an initial condition that's in Rn as well. And here, the important thing is that the independent variable t 
is a real variable. Okay, it belongs to R. Now, in a discrete time system, the formulation is almost the same, except that you can see that here I'm looking at X, which is also in Rn, and F, that is also a, a vector field from Rn to Rn. But what's happening here is that I'm considering X at time T plus delta T, which is some step uh, forward in time, as a function of what x was at time t through that function f, okay? So the right-hand side looks exactly like an ODE, but what's very different here is that on the left, t is discrete, and you can assume that it's in z or in n, okay? So it's a, an integer or a positive integer. In practice, in fact, it is in q, so it's a rational number. It is uh, like one, one, and one tenth, one and one twelfth, and two tenths, etc. Okay, but what often happens is that for simplicity, we change uh, things around so that delta t is equal to one. Okay, so for example, when we use the model later on, what we'll be looking at is x of t plus one, where t is a day, for example. So this will represent the evolution of the model from day to day. We append to this model an initial condition that looks exactly like the one from the ODE. And this gives us a sequence. I mean, if you've seen sequences, this is just a silly, little simple sequence. I mean, it can be very complicated. I should not say simple, uh, but it's a, it's a sequence and you can study it the same way you would study any sequence. And let me sort of, I said this is a crash course, so this will be done very quickly. Uh, what are the similarities and differences between ODEs and um, discrete time systems? Uh, so what you can see, let me uh, first go to the notation. So if I have a matrix, I'm going to denote SP of A for spectrum of A, the set of all eigenvalue of the I all eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay, which uh, you should remember are defined that way. Um, and then I'm going to call the spectral abscissa the maximum of the real parts of the eigenvalues, and the spectral radius is the maximum of the moduli of the eigenvalues, okay? Now, for ODEs, you have probably already seen, so this is what an ODE looks like, as we already said. We look for equilibria, equilibrium points of an ODE. They are x points x star, and I should point out their solutions x star, so they, can, they depend on time, but typically they're constant. Uh, there are solutions x star such that f of x star is equal to zero. And what we've seen, uh, and what we know, is that uh, an equilibrium point is locally asymptotically stable, if and only if all eigenvalues have negative real parts, which we can write as saying that the spectral abscissa, the maximum of the real part of the eigenvalues, is less than zero. So a discrete time system, we just saw it's something like this. So x of t plus delta t is equal to f of x of t. I take an initial condition. So you can see it looks very much the same, except that here I have a derivative and here I have a sequence. The fixed points, I'm not going to give you a course on discrete time systems, but the fixed points instead of equilibria, often people will actually call them equilibria, but fixed points of the system are points x star such that this time it's a bit different. So here I was looking for something that canceled the vector field, okay? Because when I have a differential equation, if I have an x star, which is equal to zero, this means that x prime is equal to zero. And if x prime is equal to zero there, it means there's no evolution. Well, here you're doing the same thing. Here I'm looking for an x star, which is such that f of x star is equal to x star. So if you replace this in here, this f of x star is equal to x star. This means that x at t plus tau essentially is not moving compared to f of x, uh, to x, okay? And in that case, 
we say it's uh, typically we say attractive, but just to illustrate the really the proximity between the two, I've called it locally asymptotically stable, if and only if. And in this case, it's the spectral radius having a value less than one. So all the eigenvalues are in the unit disk in C. But apart from that, there's no difference. Now, let me show you how you simulate that system. One very nice thing is that the package that I introduced briefly, I think in the first week, if I remember, um, the solve, you can use it for discrete time system. And we are going to do this here. Uh, it's very simple. So in this case, you change the call to the function by adding method equals iteration. When you do that, this signifies to the system that the, the ODE, uh, that it should be solving uh, in discrete time. So, but the rest is exactly the same. And I need to say what function I'm using. I need to say what my initial conditions are, what times I'm going to be integrating for, what are my parameters, and this is the only difference. With a little caveat here, and this I've copied from the help for this function ODE, the method iteration is special in the sense that function should return the new values of the state variables rather than the rate of change. Okay, so let me illustrate this by writing the right hand side. So this looks very much like what we did before. Okay, I've defined DD. Uh, this was what we call delta D in the model itself, but I um, used to call it DB. Um, so remember that I need I didn't detail this, but I need a delta T, which is dB over T, or delta D over T. So I need to compute delta D. So to compute delta D, I need T. So I'm computing dB. This is the variation in the number of dead. Okay, this is how the number of dead changes. And then I compute delta D, and delta D comes in all the, uh, all the equations except D and SP, okay? So this is the birth. This is how the number of susceptibles change. And you can see this is um, uh, who lambda B, remember, is infection. So it's the force of infection. So one minus lambda B is resist, resisting infection. Uh, this is people that uh, lose immunity. This is newborns. Uh, oh, this is, should be times rb here. Never mind, it doesn't change much, but this is times rb. I will correct the code and uh, and this. Um, okay, so you write exactly like you would uh, an ODE. The only thing is, remember this remark that comes with the definition of a method. Uh, it specifies that uh, you have to return the new value in the state variables, which means that the new value in the state variables is the old value that's coming in from uh, as y here, okay, uh, plus the change. Okay, if a change is negative, it will decrease. If a change is positive, it will increase. But so you can see here that every time I've added s plus the variation, L, B, plus the variation, L, plus the variation, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the only little difference with using ODE for an ODE instead of a discrete time system is that you have to remember that if you're using it for a discrete time system, you have to add your variation to the former value of the state. Now you can set the parameters. I've given values here. I should mention all the code is available on the GitHub repo. So feel free to go there. It's called Setanovich something. Um, and so then I set the initial conditions uh, and the time span, and then just call the, the function and get the solution. I'm not going to show you uh, the solutions. You can play with uh, the code and you will see this. Now, a few remarks. To set 
lambda b and lambda, uh, you actually need to explore numerically the model response. So I will show you later how you can use uh, knowledge of R0 to set some parameters that are difficult to set. But here in this case, what we have is, so normally when we have a discrete time system, we can run the same type of analysis as we do for continuous time systems, or ODE systems, for example, and find, for instance, an R0. But the problem here is that in this particular model, the typical methods for computing R0 are not going to work because there is no disease-free fixed point in this model. Because unless you completely shut off the force of infection, but the force of infection acts on the susceptibles, okay? They don't require people to be infectious. So there's no setting I to zero and analyzing the system when I equals zero, as we've done uh, many times before. Here, setting I to zero doesn't change anything. And actually, with those initial conditions that I have here, for example, I've taken a total population of 100,000, if you run the code that I'm providing, you will see that you still get some infections. Normal, because the force of infection doesn't involve infectious. Just contact between the susceptibles and a contamination agent. Okay, so I recommend that you play with it and try to get some numbers that make sense, uh, etc. Now let me take a little moment to talk about the model of Capasso. So I remind you that the model of Capasso looks something like this. Uh, it is uh, a population of humans, uh, the environment. Humans shed whatever agent they are infected with in the environment at a linear rate. Uh, they are infected by the environment at this uh, rate, g of e. So this is what these equations uh, tell you. There is um, recovery of the infected humans and there is uh, death of the pathogen, uh, the agent in the environment at this rate here. Okay, so go back to the first lecture if you want to remember this. I remind you that we took a look at an incidence function and imposed a bunch of properties and here I'm going to, because I need to impose a, an actual form for the function, I am going to assume that we have what's called a Holling type two or Michaelis Menten type functional response, which takes this form. Uh, these are H max and H half are parameters. Uh, H max determines, so when E goes to infinity, uh, when E becomes large, the H of E goes to H max and h half is the value such that uh, of e such that you get half of h max. Okay, so that's why it's called h half. So this is how I implement this. I call my function h, it uses those parameters, g max. Uh, I, I remember that we are splitting things between h and g and etc. So this is a little. Um, I called it G max, but it should be H max. Um, so I here this is just the function. Here this is the incidence function itself. So this this expression here, where H of E is this function that we just have. The right hand side is defined clear uh, the same way as before. Okay, so we've done that a few times now, so we don't really need to worry. Uh, this defines the right-hand side. Uh, we define the parameters. And we call the integration method and plot the result, and which gives us something like this. So I just called it value. Here you have H, so the number of infected humans and the load in the environment. And this is a sample solution. Now, if we want to go a bit further, I remind you that uh, we have this expression for R0, which in involves the right derivative at zero of 
phi incidence function uh, and that distinguishes between these two regimes. So if for G I've taken, if you take the derivative, you find this. So it's easy to compute the right derivative because there's no problem at zero because E is not by itself. So I don't need to compute the limit. I just stick in zero in here. And what I get is this expression at zero and therefore the R zero takes this value. Okay, so if I want to compute the R zero, I can make a function uh, and which will spit out what value of R zero I have. Now, I want to spend a minute or two to describe something that I think is quite interesting is how to deal with this using Shiny. So Shiny is an R library. Uh, it's actually made by R Studio and it's uh, used to make uh, interactive displays. Um, so there's a, oh, this is funny. This is, this doesn't appear to be clickable. Oh yes, it is clickable. Um, it is clickable and here it's clickable as well. Uh, so uh, there's some documentation, some examples. Um, what you need to do is create, I mean, it's not obligatory, but it's easier. You create a, a subdirectory with uh, the name of your app uh, and you uh, put a file in there called app.r and in uh, app.r, you need to use uh, the library Shiny. You need to define two types of elements. One is the UI, the user interface, and one is the server. So the UI sets up the graphic part of the code and the server sets up the server part of the code. <laughs> this is not very surprising. Um, it handles the computations, the generation of figures, and everything is then handled by the user interface and displayed. Uh, so let me show you how to do this. Uh, if you go to the uh, directory, uh, the uh, GitHub repo, you will find uh, a subdirectory called this with the shiny app that I'm going to show you uh, as a subdirectory. Uh, so I'm going to use what's called the fluid page to create the user interface. There's other functions that you can use if you want to fill the page, if you want a fixed page. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways. Uh, it's really a rich program, a rich uh, library. I recommend that you go there. So essentially to define the UI, we need to fill this thing. So in UI, we're going to put a fluid page and what goes in this parentheses here is what I'm going to describe now. So in UI, I'm going to put, for instance, a title panel. So that would be, for example, what I want my, uh, my panel to look like. So this is going to generate an HTML um, file, okay, uh, that your browser will be able to run. So this is what the title would be. And then you can use uh, here, what I'm going to do is set up a sidebar, okay, on the, something on the left. Uh, and in that sidebar, I'm going to put sliders. And those sliders are going to allow me to set the different values of the parameters. So I'll have things like ga gamma h, the inverse of gamma h, and I'll explain that in a second. So the idea is that I want my users to be able to select an average infectious period in days rather than the value of gamma h, which, which is the inverse of that average infectious period. Okay, so I want the average infectious period to be, oh, this should be one here. You shouldn't allow it to be zero um, because I'm going to invert it. Uh, so uh, this is a, a slider, which I'll explain in a second. And this is a classic slider. I want to set a value of CH and I'm going to call that, this is for the user, the, this will be displayed flow from humans. And I'm allowing the values to go from zero to two on the slider and the default value is 0.1. And now I have a bunch of other sliders. I'm not going to show all of them to you. Let me uh, show you just how to deal with that little trick that I had here. Uh, the inverse gamma. So what I do is with all the, uh, the sliders, actually all the parameters, but I'm defining what I, I fill in per, params here. I'm going to fill their value 
uh, algorithmically. So I just need to do this loop here. I was saying for parameter name in the names of input and input is how server, the server part will receive the values from the UI. Okay. So I really recommend, I mean, afterwards you'll see, you can go to see the code and look at how it works. But here, what I'm doing is I'm, de I'm dealing with the fact that some of the va variables need inverting. So my uh, strategy for doing this is to start a variable name with inv underscore variable name if I want to invert it. And you see here, I'm saying if the variable, the parameter name that I'm dealing with right now, one of the parameters in input, if that parameter name contains inv underscore, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the parameter name and I'm going to remove, I seek inv underscore and I replace it with the empty chain. So that means now when it hits this, for instance, now this becomes gamma h. And what it does is it takes params. So this, these are the parameters I'm going to use for the simulation of the new parameter name without the inv in, in it. And that value is one over input of the original parameter name. Okay. Otherwise, if I don't start with an inv underscore, then I simply need to say that the parameter value of param name is the input of param name. So this allows me to sort of have sliders that make more sense for the user. Well, it's not mandatory. I mean, you can do it one by one, but this is algorithmically. Uh, more interesting. Now the simulation functions like the ODE right hand side and so on, I just point out you can put you can write them outside of the server or the UI. You can use functions in the server and the UI provided they're in the same file in app.r. Uh, this will make your code easier to read. Okay, so for the functions, I'm not changing anything compared to what I did before. So I'm not showing them here. Now the server part is, uh, you see, so here it's going to create an output that's, uh, and so remember, I should point out here in the, ah, no, I didn't show this. I, I'll have to show it to you. So the output is then used in the UI part. So this thing is fed back into the UI and displayed. So in the output, uh, I'm not uh, giving a slider for the total uh, population. So uh, here I'm, I need to set it. And then I use this code that I just showed you. I set the initial conditions. I set the time span. I call the integration and make the figure. And then finally, the last line in the code is something like this. So uh, it's going to be a shiny app. The UI is what UI that I created, the server is that server that I created. And I will take a minute off to now uh, show you how this works. So I have now selected my R studio. Uh, and so what you can see here is the code as I was um, pointing out the uh, code has uh, several uh, sliders. You can see I have all the sliders here. Uh, and this is the part that I was uh, talking about and I forgot to put in the code. You can see that as part of the UI, I also have something where in the main panel of the user interface, I display the plot output from that function that I created that uh, plots the output and I'm saying what width in pixel of uh, that thing has. And then uh, this is the re these are the functions. As I said, they don't need to be in anything specific. And this is the server part. And finally, the uh, run shiny app. And so here in our studio, once you have something that it recognizes as a shiny app, you get this button run app. And I probably will have to do another uh, manipulation Yes, so you can't see it here yet, but let me just show you what's happening. So it's saying listening on HTTP one. So this has created a micro web server that is running in a window that I will make uh, visible in a second. 
Okay, so this is my shiny uh, window. Uh, it's not really showing very well here, uh, but I think you get the you get the idea. So this is the title that I defined, and then you can see all the sliders that I have uh, defined as well. You can see that this is this thing that I was detailing, rather than saying what is uh, gamma, I want to say what is one over gamma, and then I do this conversion. And what's nice here is that you can, oops, this is, I'm not on the right window. I can then play with the sliders and in real time, the system is recomputed. So you can see here, I'm in a situation, by the way, I've computed the R0 and put it as the title of the slide. So you can see what R0 here is, very large, but uh, you can see I can make it smaller. So this is uh, the dotted line is the environment uh, pathogen and H of T is the number of susceptible uh, contaminated humans. See if I increase the flow of humans, it's, there's going to be a lot more uh, agents. If I, for instance, decrease a lot the fraction susceptible at one point. So for example, the probability of having a snack, if you remember, there's a point where if I change, this is the incidence, I should go to a situation where R0 is less than one. Of course, I'm going to have trouble finding it. Uh, this is not uh, surprising. Um, it's not changing anymore. Okay. Looks like I'm not, ah, yes, I'm having an effect. So let me reduce the flow from humans. Um, at one point, the, uh, so maybe let me make an infectious period. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so for instance, here I have an R0 that's less than one. Uh, you see it's 0.79. And so what we have is uh, first a spike in the number of humans infected, but then everything goes to zero. And if I look at a uh, longer time, uh, time span, for example, you can see the solution goes essentially to zero. Okay. Okay, so this being done, remember that we then looked at the periodic case and I'll just highlight things, uh, remind you that I said that I wasn't sure about exactly how this worked because th the way the result is formulated in the, in the papers looks a little weird to me. Uh, it said that if our zero min was less than one, then there's a uh, unique non-trivial periodic endemic state. This is another one where I recommend that you play with it a bit. Uh, but just to show you how you would do in this case, uh, well, I just need to add uh, periodicity by defining, remember it's P of T, the proportion of uh, meals that you make change. And so you can just define this function here, uh, which gives you a, a function of period, period, P period and that varies between P max and P, uh, P min and P max. Uh, so this is what this thing does here. And then you need to take this into account in the, in the incidence function and it's here. So this is one slight modification. R zero also remember there's an R zero min and an R zero max. So you can compute it that way. Uh, but for the rest, everything is the same and you would work the model the same way. Uh, let me uh, go to the model of uh, Woolhouse, the first model of Woolhouse. So this is a model for schistosomiasis. Uh, I remind you that the model takes this form. Uh, I, capital, capital I, H is the average number of um, schistosome per person and little i, S is the proportion of patent infection in snails. Um, so again, uh, we would write the ODE this way. And uh, because we have an R0, we can use it to our advantage. And this is one thing that I wanted to uh, mention, uh, well, that I said that I would mention earlier. And let me do so here. Um, so this is something that I do quite often. So if you have, of course, a good estimation of the contact parameter beta, use it. 
but most of the time it's easier to estimate R0 than it is to get a good sense of beta because beta describes contact. It's complicated to, uh, in, uh, to put in practice. So what you can do here is that you will have, uh, you use the fact that R0 is alpha n beta h over gamma times mu. And you just say, well, I'm going to, instead of uh, giving myself a beta and seeing what R0 value I get, if I have some information about the value of R0, then I proceed the other way. If I have R0, I can write beta as a function of R0 and the other parameters. And so this is what I do often, is I will set a desired value of R0, and I will compute the value of beta, the transmission parameter, using that formula deduced from here. Okay, so here I get a value of beta from that desired value of R0. So I was in the first model we looked at, I pointed out that this would not be feasible. So there are times when you're not able to do this, uh, but when it is possible, it's an easy way to, to set parameters then uh, you can compute the value of R0 if you want. In this case, it's not really useful because I'm setting it, but I need it actually when I compute the endemic equilibria. Uh, and uh, well, of course, it's going to be the value that I choose, but suppose you were doing something else, it's uh, okay to do that. So here I compute the value of the endemic equilibrium in case I need to plot it. I'm not going to do that. Um, and actually, I'm just going to make a few remarks on the third schistosomiasis model of Woolhouse uh, that looked at heterogeneous contacts, and that would be it. Uh, so I'll remind you that in this case, we were looking at something which has each individual individualized and each site different. And we considered the fact that some individuals can go to some of the sites, some individuals can go to multiple sites, etc. So the model was this. Uh, so we, here, this is exactly what we saw last time. Uh, but le let me point out something. And here I haven't uh, expanded a lot because I think uh, for next week, of the sort of practical part of the course, I'm going to ask you to look at uh, some of the models that we're looking at here numerically and try to do both numerics and analysis. I, I will produce something to explain this. But what I want to stress here is that if you have a system like that system, it's what we call a large system of ordinary differential equations, or a large system in general, because it can be a large system of difference equation, it doesn't matter. But this is a large system of ODEs. There are H plus L differential equations. And in particular, H can be potentially quite large. You can think of a situation where you would have, um, I don't know, 10 water, uh, water bodies, but uh, used by uh, 1,000 or 2,000 people. So that would be uh, 2,000 plus 10 differential equations. But the type of large system is quite simple, uh, both mathematically and numerically, but it requires some organization. So one thing that I'll point out is in the past, I've pointed out that when you were using the right hand side, so let me go back, for example, to that first model, you see that here, what I'm doing is I'm using X, uh, the, uh, the state uh, vector, I'm saying, well, if I've named my state vector, as I've done, uh, of course, I'm not showing it here, but you know, like when I define my initial conditions, if I say that one of my initial condition is IS equals something and the other is IH equals something, then when you use this argument, you don't need to say X of one is IH and X of two is IS. So you can just use this as list to do that. But with a large system, this is not good. I mean, it is feasible, but it will be sort of costly. So 
typically, instead of naming the state variables, you just use your vector x, but you write down the indices. So let me explain what I mean here. You have your parameters, and this is the number of humans, and this is the number of sites. Then I'm going to define an index for the humans, and I'm going to say that index runs from 1 to h, so 1 to 100. And then I'm going to define an index for the sites, uh, which is going to be, well, from 101, in this case, to 105. And so that means that when I'm looking at the ODE, I can just go IH equals X of this, and IS equals X of this index, and I will have all my state variables uh, usable with the name IH as a vector. And the last thing I'm going to say here uh, and I'm not, uh, actually, I should move this N here because, um, but um, as I said before, when you're doing this type of computation, it's important to be organized. And here, uh, if you're careful, the fact that there's a large sum here to compute is not a problem. So let me point this out. So if I denote capital K, the matrix of the eta ij, so remember eta ij, is how an individual I contacts, uh, come, how frequently he comes into contact with uh, the site uh, J. Okay, so if you look at this, there's H individuals and L sites. And so I have a matrix, which is H times L. But if I denote IH the vector of the I's for humans, and IS the vector of the IS for uh, for uh, how many schistosomes there are, uh, how many inf uh, the proportion of infected snail in each of the sites. Then you see when I do this sum here, it's the same thing as taking the product KIS. Where well, there's an N, but I forgot. I need to rewrite this. But uh, there's a. It's essentially. Uh, the same size as KIS. In the same way, when I want to sum over I here, it's simply the same thing as taking the transpose of IH and multiplying, left multiplying K by the transpose of H. And so when you do that, you have uh, something that is very easy to compute. Matrix operations are very fast in most programming languages, including R. And so this goes really quickly. You don't have to do a lot of sums or things like this. Just use the matrix properties. And that is it for this course. As I said, I will ask some questions for next week. I think it'll be good if you worked on uh, trying to uh, understand a little bit better these models and understand a little bit better how to manipulate these models using R.